All right, let's just uh, adjust this camera a little bit and uh, have a chat, continue our chat. So uh, previously, I think I did about five and a half minutes, we were talking about combat and the, uh, the some of the modifiers that go into making up <clears throat> an effective combat. And one of the points I was trying to make, probably unsuccessfully because I didn't get all the way through it uh, to, uh, because of an interruption, but uh, we're back at, at it now, is that there were several elements, attrition points, electronic warfare, potentially adjacency and engagement, that terrain that can impact the, the net difference between attack and defense, which then will influence where you end up on the combat results chart, which is going to be on this table here. So you see you go from uh, minus five to plus nine on that table. And there's a, a wide range of results, but a very narrow spread. Worst case, you roll a one on a minus five, you're going to lose two steps as the attacker, and nothing will happen to the defender, potentially. Fingers crossed. Let me come back to that. Best case, on, a, uh, on a, an attack, plus nine, roll a ten, O2. Oh, two. Defender loses two right? <clears throat> Two steps. So you see that from this minus five to plus nine differential, it's a slow and gradual eating away at the combat unit and its effectiveness, because it's not just, oh, well, you had a full strength unit, now you flip it over and it's half strength or 75% of, of full strength or two thirds, uh, two thirds of half uh, of full strength or a third of full strength, whatever the case may be. So very few games are going to give you the granularity here that perhaps modern warfare is trying to represent to us because that's how it kind of works, I think. I think you'll see a gradual degradation of capability over time. And then all of a sudden, boom, poof, you know, the guy's gone. Uh, but there, there are some things in here that will allow you to mitigate some of those things, some of those uh, negative impacts. And sorry for the dog bark in the background as well. So uh, let's see. My point was a narrow spread and the things that impact that are very specific here. You know, these things that I mentioned just earlier on, they are potentially going to be more impactful for you than combat support points because you can throw an entire division's resources in <clears throat> and get, you know, an 11 or 12 or 13 as an attacker, combat support points allocated, roll the die and get between plus two and plus six. So it's, that's a decent spread, right? Uh, that's going to go into the pool of points that come back to impact this final combat differential. So important, yes, but Defender has the same opportunity, right? And if they're maxing theirs out, they get minus two or minus three on a bad roll, plus um, up to minus five, minus six. So part of the trick is the, whoops, excuse me. Part of the trick as the attacker is to understand what the potential capability is of the defender to apply defensive combat support and weigh the risk of, of putting too little or less or too much into the combat support. If you don't put any in, look, if you don't put any in, you are going to suffer. You will suffer badly unless you roll an eight or better. So you have a 30% chance of having no effect but you'll have a 70% chance of something something between... So let's just resume here and just stop again. So my, my point here is you're going to apply combat support points in their various forms really enough to mitigate one side or the other's potential benefit. And so the net of the attacking really power of the Warsaw Pact comes down to, can they get the most guys adjacent? Can they attack someone that's already half engaged? Can they get the least number of negative <clears throat> impact from the posture or mode that they're in? 
and can they uh, then obviously roll well, right? So, uh, so when we were playing uh, this game, uh, there was a you know, high level of frustration that was accumulating for Pete because it felt, you know, there's a lot of procedure here and there was a lot of work to get across the border and it's hard to to grok, I think, that this is three hours. So it's three hours of physical activity that's occurring for the units, you know, in terms of movement and combat and preparing to change orders and all that sort of fun stuff. So there's a, you know, you're not getting very far. You know, the first turn, uh, you may well only get to here uh, in terms of movement points. You, might, you may only move two hexes because of the choices you make or three hexes because of the choices you make because of the civilian panic rule that uh, is impact impacts the game for a period of time and then crossing the border costs uh, as well so those things are factored in and it's really not till turn two or three or six to nine hours before you're approaching Fulda and getting into that sort of contact mode where you're now looking to begin the engagement and one of the things that Pete did that we discussed that was probably an error, he said, oh, you know, uh, you know, division should really attack, uh, attack across a 10 kilometer front. And I went, you're right. So why are you attacking across a four hex front, which is 20 kilometers? And his positioning was such that he had forces attacking in through uh, Newhoff and through uh, Fulda. And then he had a second division up in the north heading for, well, I think it's Bard uh, Holderfeld, 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 what, is, what was it called? Hersfeld, that's right. Uh, sorry, guys. Sorry for all my, uh, my West German friends. Uh, but nevertheless, that, he had a, a division going that way as well. And as we spoke afterwards, I said, you know, look, I didn't want to say anything because I want you to experience the experience and have your raw interaction uh, and response without me saying, hey, this is how you should do it. Uh, we, we got into a situation we're playing another game one time and uh, had a, a, a designer telling us uh, what, exactly what we should be doing uh, several times. And that kind of takes the fun out of learning the game and learning the experience and, and having, you know, evolving and discovering tactics for yourself, right? So uh, let him do that. And I thought at one point he was going to flip the board and he goes like, oh man, there's so much work you got to do to get, you know, to get to count all these movement points. And we kind of got through that and that was great. But then we got into the combat and it's like, oh, there's too many, too much counting going on to do combat because uh, you've got air and anti-air and all that sort of fun stuff. And then you go through all these, you know, you go through this six or seven steps here and then you look at these these elements here and you uh you've got to you know got to do a little bit of work Inter interestingly enough as we as we were we stopped at the end of turn four and uh, he realized that he really kind of sort of shot the wad in terms of capability to excuse me to progress the attack much further and it was uh you know you wanted to skip the peak hour traffic so we 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 just used this game as a learning exercise so as we were discussing post, you know, post mortem, he said, "Oh no, like I really like the system, but it takes a little bit of getting used to." And I think there's a uh, there's a European sense to this game, <laughs> and I'm sorry, Fabrizio, you're probably going to hate me for this, but there's an implied logic here that doesn't necessarily immediately resonate with an American player, and there are things that are implied that are not explicitly stated. And to some degree, I don't mind that, but I get, uh, I, I've been so spoon fed by some American companies that, you know, you want everything, every single thing called out, everything line item, everything dotted, every T cross and all that sort of stuff that sometimes you forget your ability to use common sense. And we, we struck that with interdiction markers and we struck that with uh, half engaged markers. And when you step back, and use common sense and apply that to the game, everything becomes much clearer and much more fluid and much easier to appreciate rather than rummaging around in the rules, looking for a rule that explicitly states one thing or another. So that's not to say that the rules are incomplete 
or bad. They are just not written for the American sensibility, that's what I would say. And I think if I was going to offer advice on this particular uh, set of rules, I would say it needs a, a couple of North American people, not me, but a couple of North American people to offer opinions post-play, not just reading the rules, because you can read these rules and go, oh, it's all case-based and looks pretty cool and I can get it. <clears throat> it's the application of them that then it sort of loses its capability. There are some things, uh, or, or its meaning, or its, uh, and there's more nuance to it. So there are some things that may be uh, referenced on a chart that are not in the rules. There are some things that are in the rules that you might have to dig around in to find on a chart that are inferred that and not explicitly stated on the chart. And I'll give you uh, one brief example of that uh, in posture change. When you look at these here, right? Authorized posture change. This says here that uh, these are the different postures that I can move, change to based on the posture I'm currently in over in the left-hand column over here. And the number in the brackets is the number of turns it's gonna take for that posture change to occur using whatever command capabilities you decide to apply to change that rule, that, uh, that posture. And here's the cost if uh, you do it in an unauthorized manner, which is totally acceptable within the rules as a means for an individual unit to change its, po its posture. Now, looking at that <clears throat> as, a, as a player, I don't know what that one in the brackets means. And it's not defined anywhere that I could tell. So you just got to, you, you got to kind of infer, there's some things you got to infer. And I think that's one, it's the second game they've done. Two, it's... Uh, it's this European sensibility, I really do think. And three, it's, a, it's a, the application of common sense, right? Uh, but I will say that there are some things that I would you know, like to see enhanced in the rules and adjusted. And I've pushed most of that content back to Fabrizio and uh, to, um, I'm sorry, to uh, Marco so that they can uh, get a, a feel for the sort of things that we're looking for. You know, just for instance, having, while we've got unit type, unit size, unit nationality, what a unit looks like, why not just have this in here instead of just in the rules? Uh, a regiment can take five attrition points, a battalion can take four, and a company can take three, and Artie can take five, and Helo's five, and headquarters three. Why not have that right here or right here? So that we know what the, or right here. So we know what, what these guys, what sort of damage they can take. Or put in a separate box, whatever. So little things like that. So Pete packed up, said he really liked it. And I thought, oh yeah, Pete's just being nice. And I uh, said, we should really play a campaign game. And uh, let's take the, the boundaries off, the, you know, the edges off. And let's see how the game would all work together in a campaign with uh, the, the whole shooting match and get two or three guys and we'll work it out with uh, each of us uh, running uh, as a front commander and a couple of guys working with us to sort of move extra divisions as they appear or whatever the case may be. With the view that, of course, knowing some of the guys we play with, some of them will make it through one or two sessions and this is a multi-session endeavor uh, with the campaign game given it's 30 plus turns. So uh, we, we, we pick up the slack and, and do the rest by ourselves at some point, but get some guys to get us through the first half a dozen turns, which basically means, you know, getting you from here to here uh, to the point where you're about ready to cross that river and put some panel bridges down and ribbon bridges and all that sort of fun stuff and, and cross over the river and, and get after uh, Frankfurt and all the rest of it. So we're going to do that. And then Pete sent me a text just a few minutes ago and he goes, you know, man, I'm driving home and I'm thinking I already want to go and set that game up. And so he's actually headed home, going to set up a learning scenario and play through it again to solidify his understanding of the combat and uh, the movement mechanics and the different you know bits that kind of gel together. Because, for instance, when you're doing addiction, you want to do interdiction not in your phase, not in your turn, but in your enemy's turn. That's and because the, the interdiction marker is going to come off at the end of their, their phase, not your phase. Uh, and I'm not probably not articulating that clearly. Uh, obviously, each person has a turn. And in the barrage phase for each player, 
each player, both sides, get to conduct barrages, which includes interdiction. So if I do an interdiction as a Soviet player in my turn, that interdiction marker is going to come off at the end of my turn. But if I conduct a barrage in the US player's turn, that interdiction marker is going to come off at the end of the US player's turn after his movement. So it'll impact him then. Little subtle subtleties here that will uh, uh, change the way you apply the rules and your strategy and your tactics to the game. Uh, we talked a lot about you know uh, what you what it really takes to build up a solid offense and focus on two hexes for a division versus four hexes and uh, having a follow-on division and then looking back and thinking about you know what was the Soviet doctrine at that time and the game is built around that to allow you to gain the benefit of the Soviet doctrine. It's also built around the American doctrine and allow you as that uh, mobile force with screening and recon and shoot and scoot capabilities to you know, slow down and trip the enemy and then, you know, back off and slow him down again and back off or go head to head and blow that guy up. And then hopefully you've got that secondary defense line, that next phase line ready to go with defensive works and enduring points allocated and all that sort of fun stuff. So uh, I think I think this game is, uh, you know, it's not for the faint hearted. If you're, if you're just going to go set it up and think you're playing Avalon Hills D-Day, then you probably shouldn't buy this game because this game's not going to be for you and you're going to be very frustrated with it. But if you want to dig in and have a bit of, you'll have some fun while you're doing it. Uh, it's fun to play solo, I think. And I think Pete uh, would probably attest that, you know, hey, I could play this thing solo myself. Uh, but I think it's also going to be fun opposed. We had a good time today. I was, it was interesting watching him kind of come to grips with the system and he, he learns systems very quickly. So anyway, I, t I just, I'm kind of rambling on about this because I'm trying to, I'm trying to crystallize in my mind for myself what I'm thinking about the game and what I'm feeling about the game and the value, the replay value and the interest I have in it. And, and I, I'm excited that uh, Pete was interested enough for us to want to play again. And I think that's the, the point, isn't it? That we we take a look at the components and we look at the charts and the rules and the maps and everything. And we go, oh, it looks nice. Well, how does it play? And do I want to play it again? And so it's past that mark. All right, that's enough. Talk to you soon. Ciao.